Okay. So welcome to, to everybody. Um, so in Prospect, we, we focused on a climate related uh, project, projects um, and how to finance them with um, innovative financing. We had uh, a lot of interest actually uh, for our learning program um, from many cities, regions, energy agencies, uh, which the project is open to, to participate in a six months uh, learning opportunity, uh, also in transport, but we couldn't host, of course, uh, all the all the people and uh, that's why it's also very important for us that we give a chance uh, to come out and uh, share also with our mentors who have uh, submitted and uh, supported some groups in the project and share with a bigger group their experience but also to link it up with some uh, existing um, initiatives uh, that are out there and um, we invited the uh, speakers I mean, speaker uh, also related to the sums um, because we find it important that, of course, um, you work a lot with the uh, SECOPs and the sums in the cities uh, in particular. And it's so important to think about what is the best way of uh, financing um, your project, but also how to start uh, when you think about different business models and uh, funding and financing of uh, transport. So my uh, very, very short introduction is um, basically about, uh, about taking you through uh, a material that we developed primarily for, for the project, but it can be used by anybody, anywhere basically. Uh, which is called a handbook on, on transport. And then we will uh, go to Jesus and Angela, who are working for the city of Valladolid. And uh, they have been a mentor in Prospect. And they are going to talk about many different uh, projects they, uh, they worked on, but primarily also about how to build a sustainable ecosystem. And then we will also uh, go to Stefan Berland uh, from Wuppertal Institute. And he will um, talk about how uh, to work with some, also with uh, primarily with the uh, financing. Uh, and they have developed very useful materials, which you maybe heard of already, but it's a good uh, place to talk about it and uh, to share his experience. And then we will go to Ben Kennedy from um, the borough of Croydon in London. And uh, he will also share, he was also a mentor in a prospect, and he will uh, share about uh, the road access restriction uh, charging schemes that they have developed in, uh, in their borough. Uh, as I said, um, these are very interesting uh, cases and you can also find them on the Prospect website uh, with some more details. Um, let me just uh, take you through very quickly because some of you may be new to what Prospect is about. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning and um, primarily for energy transition supporting uh, cities, regions, energy agencies and uh, smaller and bigger municipalities as well to reach uh, better, um, well, the climate targets as well, but also to implement really uh, energy efficiency projects. The criteria for uh, joining a prospect was to have an implemented project as mentor and that for mentees to have concrete project ideas. Uh, we will uh, still until, run until the end of uh, November, and we will use, of course, the experiences of um, uh, this project in our uh, different uh, well, circles. You can see that uh, in the consortium, we have um, Eurocities as, as I'm representing, we also have energy cities and Federen, and Melissa was just speaking on behalf of Federen at the beginning. Uh, you have IACCP, there are a lot of uh, other organizations who are um, IHS, for instance, working also more with the research side. So IACCP is actually the coordinator. 
just to to tell you because some of you may be uh, part of these organizations that of course the results will be picked up in uh, different working groups forums so you will have a chance even the, after the project ends to use this results and uh, get in touch with with us if you are interested for instance in the good practices that you can see uh, i'm sharing on my screen but you can find them on the website and uh, today we will talk about the transport so you can um, you can also click on those and and read a little bit more about them uh, i'm talking about the the handbooks now so we prepared at the beginning of the project some um, we call them modules because we fo uh, focus on uh, private public buildings, public lighting, cross-sectoral as well, besides the transport. So for the transport module, which is today our subject, we have also uh, prepared at the beginning uh, a module, which was uh, helping also the mentor and the mentee, but it can be used by anybody, basically anytime you wish to implement a transport uh, project and you would like to look at uh, what financing to use. Then, um, so a focus of this uh, handbook, which you can download from the website of, uh, of Prospect, is uh, the management, I mean, provision and management of uh, municipal freight and mass transport, also procurement and management. Sometimes people ask me uh, if like innovative financing is uh, just the focus or procurement as well. I don't think they can be really uh, separated. So obviously the focus is both because uh, you have to have a very good concept for how you want to uh, procure. And uh, sometimes even the procurement is more innovative actually, the processes. So the objective was of this handbook to support a mentor and mentee, but you can organize in your own context and you can use this in your own context, uh, this uh, handbook as well. It lists uh, some typical projects uh, which can be implemented with uh, financing, so mobility management of municipal fleet, bicycle promotion actions, mobility action plans, attractive public transport system, also tools to foster environment-friendly traffic in cities, for instance, congestion charge, or um, it's not written here, but low emissions also, also pedestrian uh, promotion actions, car sharing, so these type of things. And you can see some parameters in this document, uh, like CO2 reduction, estimated cost, cost-benefit ratio, time frame, uh, what group to um, cover, and the key actions. So you get basically in, with this handbook some kind of basic information uh, if you have a project idea in mind uh, in your head and then for uh, funding sources we have also collected what type of funding sources are often there oh, uh, very often we see like hybrid or combined sources for this type of uh, things you all know he, as you work on the transport area that uh, one of the challenges is that uh, often municipalities are not um, owners. I mean, sometimes they are, sometimes they are not. Depends on the size as well. Sometimes it's a regional cooperation or national cooperation. So you have you can have funding sources which are from the own local, municipal, or city budget, but can be also regional or national funds. Also at European uh, funds, you can have different types. Some come from EU level for technical system project development, for instance, or you can have also uh, national or local levels. And then also from uh, European banks or some private funds can be uh, given. So it's, um, it depends really uh, on the situation. So we have uh, put in this handbook, uh, basically this list of things, which I'm just quickly going through, but you can check, of course, uh, this is just a sort of a teaser, basically, to go to the handbook for more details. And you see a decision tree here, which is, uh, again, uh, very much more visible, because I can imagine in my what I'm sharing on my screen is quite small letters, but you can check uh, there and uh, so it's really helping you to decide uh, how you can go about uh, 
implementing a, a transport related projects a project and sometimes um, a basic question is if a uh, municipality have sufficient uh, own resources or not what do you do um, if there are uh, for instance loans available so it takes you through basically the, the questions that you may want to ask when you when you implement such a project and then typically we have seen uh, some green bonds uh, we also had uh, some mentors like Paris in a prospect on uh, green bonds but here you can see a list in the handbook in the handbook of um, some of the cities who have implemented green bonds and you can really get details um, in the handbook about the advantages the prerequisites the phases you may need to go through so I will not go into details uh, today. It was just to share with you that you can uh, visit this handbook and you can also get in touch with us so we can still put you in contact with, uh, with the cities who participated in, in Prospect who may be able to help you if you plan to implement something, something similar. So I would like to thank you uh, for my part. <laughs> I don't know if there are any immediate questions to me. I have two minutes to take questions. I will check the chat quickly. <laughs> um, okay, so I don't see any questions to me directly, but uh, some. Okay. So um, there are no questions to me on uh, on this. Of course, you can still write in the chat, just please indicate for whom you address uh, the question. Then I would like to give the floor to Jesus and Anahela from uh, Valladolid. You will have 30 minutes and, um, well, 25 minutes for the presentation and five minutes for, for questions. So I invite everybody to write in the chat if you have questions. I will try to give you the right to present. <laughs> First of all, I stop sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. I'm from Valladolid. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Bernadette. Um, in this uh, half an hour, so we'll, we'll try to, um, to introduce um, uh, how we develop uh, so this sustainable ecosystem for mobility, uh, a brief overview about the city, uh, where we come from, uh, how we manage the whole innovation ecosystem in the, in the, in the city, and furthermore, uh, the funding sources we, we, we're dealing with, as uh, not only by a local, regional, or, or European funds, but mostly through uh, several projects, uh, age 2020 and, and in play. Um, well, starting with uh, with Valladolid, um, among the main characteristics of, of the city, um, the following stands out: that we are a medium-range uh, city from uh, 300,000 inhabitants, very well located uh, in the center of uh, of the Spanish Peninsula, and uh, and communicated just uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, far away from from Madrid. Um, Typical Castilian city full of uh, history and uh, and culture and heritage, but at the same time, it was, uh, uh, through the uh, past decades, uh, it became uh, a very important industrial hub uh, with a um, committed university, which uh, is not new. So it's it's come it stands from 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 the, the 13th century. One of the oldest uh, in, in Europe, but uh, at the same time, it's very, very modern and has adapted uh, to this uh, industrial development of the city uh, in, the, in the past decades. Uh, just uh, a couple of pictures uh, in which you can uh, more or less see uh, um, uh, something about uh, our city. So, the, the, the university, uh, the um, uh, cathedral. Uh, better view about the, about the river and, uh, and and so on. So this is uh, the next uh, this is slide as a uh, reflect how the people of Valladolid see the city. 
and how they would define it, uh, what they would highlight uh, about it. Uh, I mean, not only the, the whole uh, green corridor uh, um, alongside the, the river, but also when people think about the connections, the activity, uh, the, for example, the, the International Field Festival, uh, the uh, historic center of, uh, of the city, uh, the, the city bike paths, uh, alongside the, 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 main, uh, the main roads and, and streets uh, of the city and, and so on. Uh, we've launched also this, uh, this kind of um, uh, well, questions uh, for the citizenship and uh, we were really, really uh, amazed about also how people uh, uh, see our city quite different, uh, quite different vision we have also from the, from the city council. That's why also we, we think that we take into account also what, uh, what they are explained to us as well in this survey. Um, the next one is the uh, um, City Council, uh, our local government public entity. This is the headquarter uh, of the City Council. Uh, we work uh, more than 300 employees and we have a budget uh, of almost 300 million. We are considered one of, uh, financially one of the soundest public entities in the country. We have a surplus of, uh, uh, of uh, more than uh, 30 million in the, in the past five, five years, uh, which represents a, a very high percentage of, of our, of our uh, budget. And then this remaining cash allows us uh, uh, to carry out innovative policies and demonstrative actions without having affected or replaced other policies uh, that depend on the, on the current budget. Um, uh, this is how the city council is organized administratively. Um, depending uh, on the left side, also the thematic areas and cross cutting administrative areas, depending on the, on the mayor's office, uh, the general secretariat, the uh, auditing department, and, uh, and the, the other areas like uh, culture and tourism, education, uh, uh, taxes or security, and social, uh, social services. On the right side, there are a set of autonomous foundations and organizations that reinforce and implement the policy of uh, each department. Um, the city council of uh, Olive is uh, the main, maybe the center of a huge number of actors uh, to drive innovation in the city. Uh, we have uh, defined some places in which also the innovation uh, can develop some people. Uh, we're counting with uh, the private actors, uh, which are uh, closely uh, working with the, uh, with the uh, public uh, entities uh, in a very, in a very um, uh, innovative, in a innovative way. Also, with, we, we, we are working with the GMB, with Philips, Acciona, or Iberdrola. With technological centers like uh, Capi for CIDAUT, and of course, we are working with the academia, with the, uh, with the university, but also with the private universities of the city. All of them share uh, with us a common vision and show a, a common goal, which is as an innovation. Um, the, um, in the next slide, also, we can see also which. Uh, uh, what is the Agency of, uh, for Innovation and Economic Development we are working in? Um, this is the catalyst of innovation in the city, which main objectives are uh, the, the economic uh, promotion of the city, the support for employment and entrepreneurship, uh, the innovation, and uh, to um, carry out to the city strategies and, and, and plans. Um, it uh, has it, it, its own staff and manage uh, transversal, transversal Project regarding the smart economy, uh, we have to mention some programs and projects such uh, such a CREA program, which provide training, grants, mentoring, and the co-working space for the new entrepreneurs. And we have also innovative uh, programs uh, uh, to help uh, employ people to find a job. Um, the um, this infographic picture describes as well the uh, very well the temporary development of national and international projects that have been carried out in the recent years, starting with the local agenda 2021 in 2004, to the creation of the agency of innovation as catalyst of the innovation in the city, 
uh, in 2011 and going into the integrated sustainable urban development strategy in Madrid uh, 2020 until the last group on the right side of the slide, so the last group of H2020 and interreg projects that have, that have marked uh, um, before and after in the management of the of the city of the city project. Um, there are three uh, types of generation projects. Uh, there is an evolution of this innovative uh, ecosystem in the city, uh, which uh, are reflected in the generation of the of the of the projects in the first generation uh, from 2004 uh, until 2008 uh, 10. There are concrete projects also focus on urban planning and heritage. Uh, the second generation uh, until this uh, this uh, the last generation of the H2020 and interreg projects uh, were more more focused on mobility and energy efficiency, uh, in which uh, we integrated also the, the private uh, partnerships. And uh, this third generation uh, represents a, a more holistic approach in which uh, not, um, we are focusing not only mobility and energy efficiency but also in environmental issues and, and social and social issues as well um, in this third generation uh, we integrate uh, the civil society um, alongside the, uh, the, the project um, concretely to the um, to the mobility uh, mobility uh, sustainable mobility in the city um, the Green Valladolid Action Plan was released one month ago. It contains action lines to a more sustainable mobility in the new normality after COVID-19. Um, of, some of the, of the main objectives are um, a more sustainable uh, and healthier mobility, uh, open up uh, new spaces uh, for pedestrians, uh, to enhance the, uh, the bicycle lines, new lines, and better connected network, uh, mostly in the center of the city, uh, to improve the infrastructure for public transport, even with uh, already existing uh, lines uh, for this public transport. Um, the adaptation um, of the high peak public transport demand to changing mobility pattern for a better balance uh, um, with public transport offer, avoid traffic to the center of the city, just uh, trying to uh, make the center of the city, the historic center of the city, just for pedestrian, and to um, anticipate issues and risk about uh, about the parking parking slot. The um, the deployment of this uh, the action plan test evaluates uh, over this short period uh, the scenario of new normality. And beyond, and then validate as well the first results of the activities, action, and measures put in place uh, in the in this action plan, and also readapt uh, the mobility conditions uh, uh, in the in the in the city. Um, we also implement uh, in this uh, green biology action plan uh, a counting system in the in the pilot to gather information required to measure people. Talk uh, taking buses and consequently to help incentive uh, the responsibility uh, and to um, to incentive also the sustainable mobility pattern they have to they have to take and last we define incentive mechanisms for the better adjustment uh, of the bus demand to the offer and stimulates also uh, people towards more sustainable routines and, and habits. Um, we are also integrated. Um, the city is also integrated in some in some um, um, networks, international networks where we are working with. In some of them, most of them, so we are uh, working in mobility issues. Um, I think it's quite important to highlight this slide because uh, we are part of the from from uh, to, to to the Spanish smart city network, uh, Refi and Impulso. Uh, ruled by the Ministry of uh, Economy and Technology, uh, but also international and international um, and networks which stand for, of course, the Euro cities on one side, but then the other side is all the international network of Michelin cities. Um, 
great part of our so-called success as of, uh, the, of, of the agency of innovation comes from being part of this uh, revival network, uh, participating as actively as possible in the with, with our limited resources. Um, I wanted to uh, highlight as of the next uh, in the next slide as of the, uh, the sustainable mobility laboratory. Which is uh, uh, launched also by the International Recognition Institute. Um, national um, Pool of Expertise on Sustainable Mobility, which aims uh, to set up experimental solutions at the territorial level with an active participation, not only public, uh, of public authorities, but also a private of economic players uh, and citizens. This, this, this laboratory provides. Uh, solutions for the sustainable mobility and improves the uh, air quality, uh, implements sustainable urban mobility plans, good practices in the operation of uh, electric bus lines and the e-mobility clusters, and take into account the environmental challenges uh, for uh, urban uh, good transportation. And the uh, first bilateral meeting between uh, Clement Ferrand, uh, the, um, the, the uh, Host city of the of the international network Michelin cities and uh, and Valladolid uh, was uh, two days ago. Um, the promoter city from uh, uh, presented different issues, um, which were discussed, such uh, as the problem associated uh, with urban logistics, the drafting of uh, public private agreements, and the public procurement associated with the innovation and mobility. Uh, issues uh, related mostly to the implementation of uh, the hybridization of the future of the future projects. Um, the best one, as an uh, agency, uh, we plan uh, can summarize uh, in, the, in the next point, um, recognizing where we come from and what uh, resources uh, we have. Um, being humble, but at the same time uh, very ambitious uh, to, to get in projects uh, counting on the work of the right people. Uh, uh, I think also we have also a, a very a very committed and, and technically uh, very advantaged uh, people in the in the agency, uh, which is quite really rare for um, um, an institutional uh, agency. Uh, being part of the of the city council, and not only not talking, I'm not talking about also technical technical research centers, but talking about also the the, uh, the, the city council. We try to avoid also working individually, but taking into account the capability of uh, every group, uh, every group, and uh, we try um, to be transparent. But of course, of course, we're working with um, uh, for a multidisciplinary. Uh, I give the floor also to my colleague. This is the okay, uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, in this case, I would like to, to highlight in this uh, slide of what uh, we, we have been talking about a uh, city strategy, which in our case is our strategy in 2020 plus. And it's important to, to highlight uh, well, how to allocate uh, our strategy in the in this case in the mobility topic in, in our uh, thematic objective of low carbon uh, economy. Uh, the second one important point here for us is uh, well uh, to create and to identify the really well our local innovation ecosystem as uh, has uh, it has mentioned but but by uh, Jesus because we have to identify. Who, is, uh, uh, who are the main the, main, the important and the main stakeholders in our territory, but also also beyond. So, for example, here we can see uh, in the case of our remote urban project that is a lighthouse project uh, focused on the topic of energy efficiency, uh, mobility, sustainable mobility, and ICT. Well, we, we we have in our uh, value chain uh, ecosystem identified uh, well, of course, in the case of our municipality, because we here in Bravo Urba uh, uh, work at, at Lighthouse City, but also we follow a city to highlight and to demonstrate them how to implement this kind of uh, lighthouse project. 
we also, of course, uh, work in uh, align with our activities, uh, our research institutions and universities as Cartier Foundation as coordinator of the project, and also the university from uh, from Nottingham. And you can see also in the uh, in the in the part uh, of energy construction and ICT our main uh, our main partners and also. Focus in the case of industrial with energy suppliers, construction company, ICT, and of course, uh, uh, the, to highlight the importance of dissemination and exploitation of, of, of the business model of uh, a kind of project as revenue one. Um, we would like to highlight here the, this nice tool that probably uh, some of you know. know it. That is uh, well, the dashboard on, on, on the Horizon 2020 funds that we, we, you have here the, the link, and then you, you can go through to it. And you can uh, identify the, uh, the main uh, participants on Horizon 2020 funds that you know that is an important source of financing for, for our uh, smart city, city project. So you can identify. Of course, in your territory, but also beyond uh, the main uh, stakeholders that you can probably to, to share for a new consortium or well, to identify uh, your, your main stakeholders. Uh, let me show uh, only some figures of our uh, sustainable urban mobility plan because it's important. Uh, what? Because in the case of Valladolid, uh, we have a medium sized city which. Uh, we are, uh, we are very happy because uh, 30, 33, almost 33 percent of the of our population uh, work in the city, but of course uh, still uh, 30 percent of our inhabitants uh, use the private vehicle for 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 their for his uh, uh, mobile street. And also, well, we are now using a bit more the bicycle, uh, the use of the bicycle, and the, well, in the case of public transport is almost 13% uh, of our population. <clears throat> uh, in the case of uh, mobility, well, we, 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 we can say that uh, traffic jams are not a big problem in the city of Fire it's maybe a flat city. Uh, but of course, there is uh, an important issue there in the, in the case of uh, contamination issues. And so uh, we, we deployed an important uh, action plan against contamination issues that we, well, it has three uh, main stages. The third one is separation phase, in which uh, when we detect uh, some uh, uh, contaminants are increasing, uh, then we, we launch the separation phase. Uh, well, we encourage people to, to know it and to take uh, uh, specific measures. Then we have also the second one that is the working phase, in which we increase the, uh, the, the, the offer of the public transport. And the third one that is the other, that is also very well, we have uh, important uh, issues with the contamination. Uh, we launched the alert, alert one that, <coughs> well, uh, let's say uh, we don't allow the, the private vehicle in the city center, and we also encourage to use the public transport and to take prevention to more to, to those people more vulnerable uh, about uh, pollution episodes. Uh, let me show in this uh, in this slide well uh, how. Uh, we uh, reach our mobility strategy focused from different uh, perspectives. Uh, of course, in the heart of the uh, strategy, we have uh, the, 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 the citizens, the people, uh, in which uh, well, it's so important for us to engage them in the, in the design of the, of the sustainable mobility strategy with, um, for example, we have and a specific project for France that engage them to, to, to help us to define uh, our mobility strategy uh, using things as uh, citizens' panels, and they can also well, uh, uh, 
Hikael, uh, the bad thing for, for, for how to uh, enhance our mobility infrastructure. We also uh, uh, reach the, the sustainable mobility in the case of renaturing the city because we have an important uh, project that is also a life of project that, that is urban renap that uh, work it's, uh, its main objective is renaturing the city using natural range solutions. And well, in the case of mobility, uh, we do uh, that uh, make more eco friendly our, uh, our infrastructure with uh, green bike, bike lanes, also with uh, green can canopies in the, in the street for uh, savvy uh, density and stones, also with green facades, and uh, so on. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, in the case of uh, electromobility, we have a Roma urban project that will. Uh, enhance our public transport with the uh, use of uh, e buses uh, charging via public program. And also, well, uh, of course, the importance of ICT technologies, for example, we use with uh, transforming transport projects, we use data technologies, data and business intelligence technology uh, to enhance our uh, traffic management control. And to enhance, for example, the lower and zones in the in the city, and also a, a very important smart city project in which uh, we use um, mobile phone technologies to, um, to to gather all the services of the all, all the services for citizens in mobile uh, services. And finally, uh, this is the, the last one. I think. <laughs> You can see here our well, our uh, holistic approach from different uh, perspectives. For example, you can see in the previous uh, on the slides uh, uh, that we use multiple sources of financing uh, for, because uh, our projects are financed by Horizon 2020, but also by ERDF. Uh, Interweb cooperation is also very important uh, for, for us. And <clears throat> so, uh, uh, another uh, perspective that we can obtain a holistic approach is, as, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, it is the sustainable mobility from different perspectives. And of course, the importance of our team, our building capacity, thanks to the agency for, for innovation. Of course, the importance of uh, networks and studies visits and mentoring process as project as prospect that it was has been very important for us uh, to share with students and to learn a lot about sustainable mobility also. And of course, our uh, multi-stakeholder involvement for academia research and also citizens, citizens from uh, citizen associations and companies. And when finally in this slide is well, a very uh, single and complete uh, structure when you can see some, some, of, the, some of the new instruments um, and other kinds of things and, uh, and instruments that you can see and in our case uh, what we use to, to finance in our mobility projects. And here, the one stop shop uh, that probably you know, uh, funding for cities, where it's well, a kind of summary of the different uh, financing and funding sources from, from you. Well, I think that uh, this is all from our side. Um, if there are any questions, of course, we are here to for answer that. Thank you very much, Angela and Jesus, for uh, for your presentation. Uh, there is one question in uh, in the chat. Uh, how do you secure political support for your initiatives? Well, actually, um, as I said, so we have uh, gathered um, in the last five, five six years in Valladolid, we gathered so all the the, um, the city council areas in order just to launch some projects uh, uh, commonly. And uh, um, on one hand, so we have the, we have the mayors so which is really committed to the big projects. And on the other hand, 
uh, we have to rely as a, as a transversal agency, we have to rely on some other areas like uh, um, um, security, mobility, uh, or, or tax, uh, or, or, or what some other areas, you know, environment as well. So um, um, the political commitment of the, of the councillors are, are fully uh, once they have uh, seen as a result of some project and uh, uh, once they have also seen as the reaction of the citizenship uh, as well. Take into account as this, that uh, on one hand we have remote one, on the other hand we have uh, you and you now, they are two H2020 projects which has uh, a lot of uh, actions and uh, and uh, which are implemented in the in the city. Um, the the citizens have have seen as well uh, through the last uh, five years or so not only um, electric vehicles in the city but charging points as well. The green of facade, uh, um, uh, a green uh, city pathway, and so on. So some uh, a lot of measures which uh, are un which were unknown. Uh, five, six years ago uh, in the city, but uh, nowadays as well are very, uh, very well known and uh, and uh, from from the from the citizens. And these these have uh, the, the, the perception of the of the politicians and uh, 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 is fine uh, and and, uh, and uh, uh, they have uh, they have uh, taken into account also this this perception and also uh, had uh, committed to with the with the actions of the agency. Thank you very much, Jesus. And uh, I would like just to add to this that um, it was really, really impressive when uh, because we had a study visit in Valladolid uh, with Prospect, and we could really meet also the the political level. They were fully committed. We met many colleagues also from uh, different stakeholders who contribute to your project. So I think that you really managed to build an ecosystem that is exemplary for many others who, who wish to implement this type of uh, project transport or smart cities. So thank you very much for sharing your experience. I don't see any uh, questions right now in the chat, so I will move to the next uh, speaker. But I would encourage uh, everybody to write in the chat if you have questions to Jesus and Akela then please indicate their name or put via the lead. So at the end of, uh, end of our um, webinar, I'm going to look at still the chat uh, to see if you have any questions to them so you don't miss the opportunity. If now you didn't have uh, you know, any questions, maybe by the end you will have. So I will take those questions at the very end of uh, the webinar. But now I would like to give the floor to Stefan. So I will make you a presenter, or do you want me to share your slides, Stefan? No, just make me a presenter and then we'll see. All right, okay. So please uh, give a few words about yourself in the meantime, and uh, yeah, why I'm giving yes, you Yes, uh, I'm, I'm Stefan Welland. I'm a senior researcher at the Antwerp. There we go. Um, there and now so this we see your screen yes it works yeah, this is good. yeah. i will quickly turn on my camera to say hello but just ah, great. since i'm <laughs> hey, hey since i'm sitting in the middle of nowhere in, in my uh, holidays i just turn this off to to make sure that the presentation is going fine i'll be back after the presentation for more questions then good so there we go yeah there we back uh, close this. Ah. Okay, should work now. Yes, as um, said, my name is Stefan Werland. I'm senior researcher at the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment and Energy, I'm based in Berlin. And I will present the findings of, or the key messages of the topic guide on funding and financing, which we um, prepared for last year and which was published in the framework of the renewed sump guidelines together with a lot of other reports by the way also a report on procurement um, which initially was one rec uh, report with the funding and financing um, paper 
as you said, these issues are quite um, related, but then we, we decided to, to split these into two. So there are a lot more um, topic guides um, on the ELTIS website available. And today I'm going to talk about the key messages from the funding and financing summit thing. Um, and we talk, ah, yeah, and, and just for the, for the organization, I, since I'm restricted in time, I would start with some key messages and conclusions and, and uh, things, other things you found talking to cities over the last couple of days, and then briefly walk you afterwards to the instruments as far as I can get, and the rest you're going to read in the topic guide anyway. So um, if we look at the mobility transition that is just underway everywhere, we find that there is a huge finding gap um, that most these cities have to be if we're talking about urban mobility transitions. Um, for example, the EU Commission states or expects um, a 35 billion euro funding gap annually for urban transport alone to achieve the 2030 climate energy targets. And secondly, the mobility transition um, will probably save you money in the mid to long term, specifically if you also count in the external effects. Um, but it requires upfront investments and quite huge upfront investments that cities face. Um, secondly, there are, there are different kinds of financing need, needs which you should consider talking about the different finding instruments. There's money that you need for preparing um, an, an air mobility plan, for example, or um, sustainable urban transport measures. Um, there you need money to finance your staff, either internal staff or external staff and consultants to conduct feasibility studies, to do public participation processes and so on. Then there is the construction and procurement stage, uh, which requires higher amounts of money that are spent over a short to medium time period. And finally, the operation and maintenance stage, um, where you probably need a continuous flow of, of relatively smaller amounts, but over a long time period to, to allow services to operate and infrastructures to be maintained. Then um, talking to cities, um, we found that there, there are a lot of funding and financing mechanisms available out there. As we have seen the last couple of slides from Valladolid, for example. Um, but still, most cities and regions are struggling to find adequate instruments, so instruments that match their needs, that are um, um, or where they are eligible for, and so on. Um, also found that application processes are time consuming and require expert knowledge, which is a challenge specifically for small administrations with restricted um, staff capacities. Um, then, of course, not all instruments are applicable in member states. It depends on the, the legal power of cities for implementing certain fees and charges, um, which is feasible in one member state, but probably not applicable in other member states. Um, political uh, support is also a big issue, specifically when it comes to, to um, demand management measures that generate revenues and which face strong opposition from the public normally or initial opposition. Uh, and finally, as we've also seen in the presentation before, you need a combination of different mechanisms and instruments um, to, to cover all the different kinds of projects and project stages that you have to, to finance. Oops. Uh, that's fine. So, um, yes, and in the end, um, in the ideal case, you would have a finance strategy with clear targets and indicators, which is based somewhere in the mobility strategy. You've heard about some already. Some is a structured approach how to um, how to define a sustainable urban mobility plan um, with different stages and different tasks that you that you could go through in an ideal world um, and financing issues and, and options to, to bring in indicators and specific financing plans are in the measure planning stages in step 8.2 and 9.1 where you detail your financing plans. Then finally, there's a difference between funding and financing, which should be pointed to here, um, since these two notions are normally used quite interchangeably. Um, the big difference between these two, two approaches is that funding is an amount of money that you get from normally a public budget or a foundation, which you can spend, and you're not expected to pay the money back. 
Financing, on the other hand, is money that you borrow for a specific purpose that you get from, from banks, be it private banks or publicly owned banks, um, investment funds and other investors. And the point here is that these people tend to want their money back and also to get an interest payment on top of that. So funding is money that you get and you have to spend for a specific purpose, not financing back and financing requires somehow another alternative source of revenues to, to repay the money that you bought. Um, this is the structure of the topic guide just I'm presenting here. Um, it, it is an attempt to structure the different financing and funding sources that you have. Um, and also, normally, if I had time, I would also talk about how to reduce the direct cost of projects that you have to bear by involving the private sector. I would skip this section today due to time constraints, but um, still do this with another topic guide. Instead, I'll focus on the on the revenue side and how to increase your, the, the money you have available, which starts with local revenues, um, short dimensions or briefly mentions national and bilateral funding sources, EU funding programs, and then how to uh, external finance sources as well. Yes, and that's the most obvious um, approach, but still this is quite a political decision whether to shift money from car-related investments to more sustainable modes, um, which, yeah, is, as I said, the most obvious option, but I'm not going to talk about that right here, but keep this in mind, please. Um, starting with local revenues, um, most common revenues source is of course the money the, you, that you get from providing a service, um, more specifically public transport. There are some examples of cities that try to make, uh, to fund, uh, to finance public transport, not from fares, ticket sales, but from the public budget, but these are really niche where this happens. So um, making users of, of public transport services pay, as I said, is quite common. Um, you get money from ticket sales, but also from lease of advertising space and vehicles and at stations. Um, this is quite good, but of course there are trade-offs between attracting passengers and social concerns, social tariffs on the one side and cost coverage issues on the other side. Uh, when we talk to cities, we learn that the best performers normally cover up to 70% of operation costs um, from, from these revenues. Um, many more cities cover a much smaller share of their operation costs from, from these revenues. So normally public transport is not cost covering. Um, then the income that you generate will only be available after the service starts and the operation starts. So you will probably not use the money to construct new, new public transport lines, for example. And of course, as we've seen in the last couple of months, there is a higher uncertainty related to the expected income. So we had a tremendous drop in passenger numbers over the last years due to Corona uh, months due to Corona crisis, which caused a lot of problems financing public transport services in many cities. Um, other local sources of revenue are pricing measures or demand management measures um, that aim at disincentivizing only private car use by charging the private car use in the city. Um, quite widespread is parking management as one approach. It's quite easy to implement. Most cities have legal competencies to introduce parking management schemes, which are fees for the private use of public space. Um, implementation costs are quite moderate, and this is why we see a lot of these parking management schemes across European cities. Um, much less widely spread uh, road pricing and congestion charges. Ben's going to talk about that. I'm curious to hear about your experiences. Um, so we only have a few examples in the EU of these kinds of um, fees. Since um, cities often lack legal power to introduce road pricing, so that's simply not allowed to in many member states. Um, there's high political resistance, high upfront investments, depending on the technology you use, and also legal concerns related specifically to automated number plate recognition and data protection concerns. As I said, there are only a few examples. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear about one of them today. Um, employers' contributions are another source of local revenue streams. These are charges that employers, not employees, pay to subsidize, and, and revenues are used to subsidize public transport. 
these contributions may be based on different objects. Um, this might be working parking, workplace parking spaces, just the number of parking places that um, employers provide for their employees. One example is Nottingham, which introduced a working parking levy of about 430 euros per year per parking place. And the revenues are used there to um, to invest into the city, the city's transport infrastructure, e-bus um, procurement, and the extension of the tram network. There's one example of a so-called Dienstgeberabgabe in Vienna, where the employer pays two euro per week per employee, and the revenues go into the Vienna's metro extension and also the operation right now. And most prominently, the Bassement Transport in Ile de France, which is a tax that's based on the, on, the, on the salaries and calculated as a percentage of the salaries that employers pay. And this tax contributed in 2017 42% of the total operation costs of Ile de France mobility and also a share of the investment costs. So these three are quite successful examples of employers' contributions here. Um, finally, there is land value capture and development contributions, which you'll find in different cities in the EU. The idea behind it is that land developments require transport infrastructure and services, um, that these new developments generate a new, an additional burden on infrastructure and public transport services. And on the other hand, that the provision, provision of high quality transport services increases the value of surrounding land areas and property. So the idea is that those who profit from the development should also contribute a share of the costs of public transport. Uh, we found some examples, um, for example, in Barcelona, uh, the mobility tax is a surcharge on property tax, so it means a recurring amount and the um, revenues go to, to the regional transport operator. Um, England and Northern Ireland introduced the stamp duty land tax where owners pay a certain amount when they purchase a property of a certain value. And finally, infrastructure, community infrastructure levies from England and Wales, where land developers contribute um, and where revenues are then used for public services and infrastructure. There's a debate going on whether refencing local revenues for sustainable mobility is actually a good idea or not. There are arguments for that, so you have an additional source of income. And specifically related to the push measures um, parking management and and congestion charging, for example, um, it increases the acceptance when it's made clear that the revenues are used to have better alternatives to private car use. Um, on the other hand, you run into the risk that you reduce the contributions from the general public budget, that you then have to rely on a less reliable source of income. As we've seen, revenues are to predict from public rent by operations, for example. And finally, if you use push and pull approaches, um, you degrade your own source of income. If less people travel by car, you earn less money from, from parking management and also congestion charging. So it can't be answered here right now, depends on the specific circumstances in the city, but um, we've learned that the arguments against ring fencing local revenue for sustainable mobility are quite valuable, obviously here for many cities. Um, very briefly to national and bilateral funding programs. Um, there's a lot going on now in the framework of Corona recovery packages, which are coming up now, so we're following that. Um, the most um, pre-corona national level support programs focused on the procurement of e-buses, but also on the preparation and development of pumps. One example for e-bus procurement is the German National Electric Bus Funding Program, where the government um, took over 80% of the additional investment costs for e-buses uh, compared to diesel buses, and this included the charging infrastructure. This was quite a successful fund, obviously. An example for bilateral programs is uh, we found in, in Romania, in the city of Lucinapoca, where a Swiss Romanian corporation supported the procurement of e-buses, and Switzerland provided 85% of the costs of the e-buses there. So it might also be worth exploring if something similar exists for your country. Then, tapping the, the issue of EU funding programs, 
Um, you've already heard from Valladolid and um, the European Structural Investment Fund seems to be quite interesting. And um, these funds are implemented by member states in the region, financed by the EU, and they support economically viable projects on sustainable transport networks, bottlenecks, amongst others. Um, below the, the, the umbrella ESF, there are five separate funds, including the European Regional Development Fund and the Cohesion Fund. Um, as I said, these are implemented by member states, so the, the details differ from country to country, member state to member state, um, and we can't go into detail here. But what is interesting about these two funds is they are realigned now to fit the um, 21 to 27 um, financial framework. Um, five policy objectives are identified right now includes uh, Smarter Europe and the development of digital services and applications, which quite good relates to, um, to multimodal transport, to digitalization and the mobility sector and the transport sector, app development and so on. Um, Greener Europe mentions investments in energy efficiency. This probably fits well with e-mobility and procurement of e-buses and tramways. Uh, connected Europe, which um, focuses on multimodal urban mobility that also includes tramways and metro lines. We'll hear more about that in the, uh, with the CEM. Yeah. Social Europe, which I didn't find anything that, that directly relates to urban mobility. And finally, Europe closer to citizens, which mentions integrated urban development strategies, probably also including some STEM and mobility strategies. Um, the Connecting Europe Facility, CEF, is a fund that focuses specifically on infrastructure and cross-border infrastructure investments. So um, it's nothing to do with urban mobility in the first place, but it also focuses on urban nodes. And in this area, there is also an, an strengthening expected for the upcoming financing period. Um, examples of projects that are already funded under the CEF uh, comprise the digital bike storage solutions for urban nodes or last mile connections and different kinds of charging infrastructure for electric vehicles and in different European cities. So might also be worth exploring if your city is kind of a, one of the nodes of um, the CF or the, the tent. Then we've also seen Briefly, in the least presentation, different kinds of support instruments that specifically the European Investment Bank provides together with different partners, including Commission and uh, ERPD. Um, just to be mentioned here, Elena, which, which provides grants for larger project developments. Um, Jaspers, which supports the preparation and implementation of ESAF projects, or Jessica, which is a financing engineering mechanisms. These, these um, programs do not support the projects themselves but all the preparation work, which might also be valuable for you. Finally, looking at external financing, um, most obvious, there's the European Investment Bank, which is a publicly owned bank owned by the member states of the EU. And um, the EIB provides loans for, for large scale mobility projects, the share of over 50 million euros, and which are in line with the EU objectives. EIB covers half of the project costs, the other half needs to come from other sources and the project must be financially viable. And this is an example how Thessaloniki, for example, finds their, their metro line. They had a 50% um, EIB loan, then 10% funding from the uh, Greek state and 40 were other European subsidies. Um, the EIB has a transport lending policy from 2011, which might be interested to have a look at. So public transport is their one key area and also in the projects and schemes that are based on the user pool that pays principles. Um, there is a support instrument from the EIB specific looking at cleaner urban transport, which is called the Cleaner Transport Facility. Um, it supports investments in low carbon vehicles and infrastructure and combines different financial um, instruments with advisory services. Um, what we found with one, one issue with the EIB projects is that they tend to focus on large scale projects. As I said, normally EIB funding goes to projects that with a, uh, with a volume of, of 50 million euros or more, which is a lot for smaller communities. 
Um, there are different other kinds of, of financing instruments uh, for smaller or mid-sized projects. For example, the European Energy Efficiency Fund, as we mentioned here, is one example, which provides um, uh, funding for projects from 5 to 25 million euros and specifically targets municipal, local, and regional authorities in the realm of energy efficiency, including e-mobility, car sharing, etc. Then, as already announced, um, the, the, the learning handbook of the Prospect project um, yeah, greatly explains different kinds of, of bonds, so I don't have to go into detail here. Um, bonds are debt finance instruments, similar to loans, to, um, to, to, to attract external investment for capital expenditures. Um, they have a long time period normally of about 20 to 30 years. Um, they have fixed interest rates, are tradable and attractive to institutional investors quite often. So it's a long-term, quite less um, predictable um, source of finance. There are different kinds of bonds, city bonds, revenue bonds, and green bonds, where the latter is specifically interesting for, for sustainable mobility projects. Green bonds are bonds where the proceeds are ring fenced for sustainable projects. Um, and they are also interesting for long term investors that, that consider conventional um, business models a bit dangerous and more focused on green solutions. There are different certification schemes. I have taken here the climate bond standard. And, um, this graph outlines which kind of projects are eligible under the, the um, certification scheme. So this is everything that goes into e-mobility and investments related to combustion engines, um, filling stations, parking facilities, and so on are excluded from this standard. Just to add another example of the list, that Bernadette already provided of different examples for green bonds. Um, we found the RATP, the Régime Autonome des Transports Parisiens. They launched the Green Bonds Program in 2017, which was quite successful, obviously. Um, yes, yeah, so you'll find more information about that as well on, in the um, topic guide. So finally, that's another attempt to structure all the different instruments that I've been talking about and a bit more as well. Um, differentiated first by the, the level of the political level from starting from the city or local level to the EU and also along the different stages of project development starting from plan development preparation to construction procurement and the, to service provision operation and maintenance. Well, just only means for me to, to thank you again at the topic guide that you can download from the ATLAS website. Good. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, I'm just checking if there are uh, any questions for, for you that I could take from the chat, but I don't really see anything. Melissa, did you see something? Um, no, nothing yet. Okay. okay. Good. So you you can still have a chance at the end of the webinar to ask questions to also uh, via Dolly, I mean Angela and Jesus, or to Stefan. Just please write in the in the chat their names so we can take your questions uh, later. I would just like to remind everybody because some of the people arrived in the meantime that we <laughs> we were presenting that. Um, the webinar is recorded unless you express uh, that you don't want it to be recorded and will be published on the website uh, and also will be shared together with all the materials, I mean, the presentations of today. Uh, and then you can find all the materials, uh, for instance, um, the um, document uh, Stefan was referring to or I was referring to, these are on the website of uh, with the link presented so you can find everything there. I would also like to say, uh, just to make the link between the two presentations, that um, obviously uh, Jesus and Angela couldn't go into details, but when uh, 
when we worked together with a group, uh, we had a study group in Valladolid, we had a chance to understand how they procured electric buses and how they build up a new business model uh, with the private sector as well. So their biggest interest actually uh, was from the group to understand how to procure correctly and how to make uh, decisions that are on long term, both politically, both uh, in technical terms speaking, are serving the best the city. So this is just for info for you that um, because Stefan mentioned also the electric buses that Vidalit has that uh, experience as well. And I have seen it in practice, so it's a really nice example. And you can uh, contact them, I suppose, later, or you can ask uh, questions about this as well. If you if you would need to do something similar, then you have, uh, well, their expertise at your service. And now I would like to move to another uh, very, very good expert, uh, Ben. Um, ben, I would like to try to give you the presenter rights. So... This way you can uh, share your screen and we make sure that you, yeah, you have all the rights to do that. So Ben, okay. yeah, <laughs> please just uh, take us through a little bit who you are and then. Of and course, then... yes, sorry. Um... And yes, sorry. Um, I'm sure you're used to working, uh, you know, with non-native speakers. Just know that there are a lot of non-native speakers, so please talk like slow as so slow possible because sometimes. Apologies, yeah, I will no, try it, my it, best. It's just I, fine. I'm struggling to turn on the camera at the moment. Ah, yeah, that um, uh, that I cannot really help you with unless you click on the camera sign, turn on camera, and then it should work. Yeah. Um, Yeah, apologies, I can't seem to get the camera to, to work, I'm afraid, so um, no I can problem. always send them out a photo of, of what I look like later. <laughs> um, but let's uh, let's get started. Can yeah. everyone see my screen? I can see your screen, yes, that seems okay. to work, Good. yeah. Okay. Um, so yes, I am Ben Kennedy. I'm the Strategic Transport Manager at uh, the London Borough of Croydon, and I'm going to give a, a presentation on um, sort of charging uh, schemes and, and local access restrictions in London. So I'm just going to give a, a quick overview of, of some of the charging schemes we, we already have in, in London, um, and then I'm going to talk in more detail about some of the local access restrictions we've been delivering um, in more detail. So I think everybody obviously knows, well, I assume most people know where London is, um, and uh, it's got a population of 9.3 million. Croydon is, is one of the 33 boroughs within London. Uh, it's there in the, in the south. Um, it's uh, one of the largest authorities uh, within the city, um, with a population of about 400,000. And of those 400,000 residents, they have about 158,000 cars. Um, if we were a standalone city on our own within England, we'd be the eighth largest city um, in England. However, um, because we're just a suburb of London, uh, we just kind of get absorbed with, with the rest of Greater London. But we're planning for 40,000 homes in the next 15 years. So we're going through a period of regeneration and growth. Uh, and we're, we're currently home to London's only tram system. That's about our claim to fame, really. Uh, just an overview of, of the existing charging schemes in London. Uh, I think everyone's aware of a couple of pan-London cordon schemes where, where vehicles are charged for entering um, an area uh, based on their emissions or um, or just for entering that zone. The first one is the Central London Congestion Charge Zone, um, abbreviated as CCZ. Uh, this is where you pay to enter during certain hours, um, during the daytime, 
and that generates approximately 170 million euros income for um, the city. And on the right hand side, you can see an image of the map of where the congestion charge currently covers. It, it covers the sort of West End. City of oh, apologies. Uh, let me just answer that. Sorry about that. Right, apologies about that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and that's the congestion shell zone enforced by a ring of cameras. We then have the ultra low emission zone, the ULES, um, and again, you pay to enter if the vehicle doesn't meet certain emission standard. This, at the moment, covers the central area as shown on the right since April 2019, but it will expand to the whole of inner London in 2021. Um, and this at the moment generates approximately 55 million euros um, per annum. That is, is a fair bit lower than was anticipated originally because so many people um, and businesses made the switch to cleaner vehicles in advance of the launch. We then have the London, the low emission zone. Apologies, it's, it's quite confusing all these <laughs> zones. This is a London-wide scheme targeting uh, the larger, more polluting vehicles such as lorries and buses, and they will have to pay to enter from um, October 2020 if they don't meet the emission standard. So all these, these large schemes are all managed directly by the Mayor of London and Transport for London, TfL, uh, and actually there's very limited influence from the local boroughs, uh, local boroughs like ourselves in, in Croydon. And the income from these schemes is, is retained centrally by the mayor, uh, and it's then distributed according to the mayor's priorities, which aren't always the same as, as the boroughs. So um, we have to sort of find our other ways of, of generating money. This slide, we're I'm giving another overview of the, the existing schemes that um, operate already or are due to operate uh, within the city. Uh, if you look at the table on the left hand side we have the ccz of the congestion charge zone and that's the the yellow circle in the very middle of uh, greater london and to enter that uh, you have to pay 15 pounds per day that's about 16 16 euros uh, and that's every day from seven in the morning till 10 at night uh, and that's for any vehicle entering the zone since 2000, 2003 um, as long as you've got um, unless you've got an exemption or you're disabled or you're a resident within that area. We then have the ULES, the ultra low emission zone, um, and this covers the same area at the moment, the, the yellow um, center. This is, is £12.50 for cars, small vans, motorcycles, or £100 for lorries, buses and coaches. That operates 24-7 every day, and that's been operational since April 2019, and as I mentioned earlier, expanding into inner London in October 2020, and that will cover a population of about 3 million people when that happens in October. And the inner London is considered the, the area uh, that's light green. The requirements for that, you'll have to pay if, if you enter this zone, um, if your vehicle doesn't meet um, the Euro 3 for motorcycles, Euro 4 for petrol cars and vans, Euro 6 for diesel but cars or vans, and Euro 6 for uh, lorries, buses and coaches. We then have the, uh, the Pan London Low Emission Zone, which you can see here in, in dark green. And that is for any vehicles over 3.5 tonnes, uh, larger lorries or, or buses and coaches over five tonnes. And that will be a, have to pay a charge of £300 or £100 um, to enter if they don't meet Euro 6 for nitrogen dioxide and um, particulate matter. And again, that will operate 24-7 every day from October 2020. And sorry, apologies, I should have said ULES expansion into inner London is actually from October 2021, not 2020. So, um, yeah, TfL manages these bigger schemes, but us within the boroughs, we, we, we don't have the resources to implement um, and deliver these, these larger charging schemes. So we tend to focus on, on smaller scale local um, access restrictions 
the primary for the purposes of air pollution, traffic management and, and road safety. And we have direct control over these. Uh, and that means that we can get to keep the income and revenue generated by these schemes. Um, but often it's through penalty fares rather than uh, a charging scheme. So um, this is not ideal uh, because as mentioned elsewhere, it, it, it can have negative connotations about penalty fine. And also as people avoid the scheme, it, it can, the, the income will reduce over time. But um, it, it's a much easier way of, of delivering some localized um, interventions and improvements. I'm going to primarily talk about Croydon school, school streets. These are access restrictions outside busy destinations, mainly for congestion, emissions and road safety reasons, but I'll also give a brief overview of um, zero emission streets, which are the access restrictions being introduced in response to air pollution. Uh, and then there's also bank junction, and this is an access restriction for um, giving priority to buses and cyclists. Uh, to improve safety for um, vulnerable road users such as pedestrians. Um, I'm just going to talk about school streets. Bernadette, am I talking too fast or can yeah. I, should I slow down a bit? No, it's all right. It's perfect. So, uh, just going to talk about the need for school streets. Well, Croydon has a very large population of, of young people under 17, um, almost 93,000, which is a quarter of the entire borough's population. So this means we have a lot of schools. We have 93 primary schools, 25 secondary schools or high, high schools, and then a further 27 special or private schools. Many of these are, are high schools. Um, so this means a lot of schools and a lot of um, school run traffic. And, and these boxes just give you an idea of, of some of the reason why we're, we're doing this. Um, large areas of the borough are breaching um, air quality uh, standards, the national dioxide legal limit. Uh, we've got the highest rate of childhood asthma emissions in, in the country. We have over 205 deaths each year attributed to air pollution. And shockingly, 40% of our children and 60% of adults are overweight with um, and just 26% of residents are getting their minimum active 20 minutes um, active movement and exercise a day. So I mentioned, yeah, the school run is, is a major contributor to congestion in Croydon, um, and, and it's particularly harmful combination of both air quality and inactivity. And that's um, fear of cars and fear of traffic, then, influences parents to drive and it's self-perpetuating. The more people drive, the more people are scared to walk and cycle to school. So this is why we felt that something had to be done. Um, and why now? Well, public opinion has certainly changed. Um, we found both um, across the media and, and so the responses, um, and the engagement we have with the community that um, it, it's no longer tolerated and no longer acceptable for people to, to park and um, and cause congestion and air pollution in schools. And we as local authorities, we do have a duty to exercise our powers to um, ensure that the, the roads are moving safely and there's um, limited congestion, and, um, and we have to take into consideration the national air quality strategy. Historically, parking enforcement um, has proved very ineffective near to schools. We send along the parking wardens um, the parents have parked, sat in their cars, they see the, the parking warden coming along and they drive off and, and we can't enforce. We, um, our parking services team uh, are relatively large for outer London uh, and they operate a camera enforcement of, of decriminalised parking and moving traffic contraventions. So each year they, they issue about 105,000 parking contra contraventions and 80,000 moving traffic contraventions. Um, and I appreciate in, in London, local authorities and councils have the powers to do this and powers to issue fines, whereas elsewhere in the country and elsewhere in other countries in Europe, um, this is often left to the, the local police. So now in Croydon, we have 11 school street schemes covering 16 schools, uh, with a further 10 under development and due to be uh, launched uh, in, in the next six months. 
but the plan is to reach 50 schemes by by 2023 just to describe what actually well, what a school street actually is is a section of road outside the school or near the school which at the start and end of the day is, is restricted to use by pedestrians and cyclists and uh, most motor traffic is prohibited vehicles are permitted to remain parked and then drive out of the scheme at any time so if, if a resident is already parked up in the street and then decides to leave um, during school opening hours they, they'll be fine it's very simple and quick to install you it just involves putting up cameras and some signage uh, the unattended ampr cameras the ampr cameras are automatic number plate recognition cameras um, so they have a continuous presence the residents and, and others are put on an electronic exemption list so um, they're not fine for, for um, coming in and out and then the video is then watched um, back by an enforcement officer who decides whether there's contravention and a, uh, a penalty charge notice or a fine is issued um, by the post to the driver. That's £130 um, or £65 if they pay promptly. Uh, the cameras are then switched off during the school holidays, um, so nobody gets fined then. And um, when the school is, when the scheme is initially launched, the first month, we um, just issue advisory warning letters so people aren't fined for the first month to give them a, um, a period of settling in and then after the month uh, the fines start and I'll just show you a quick video showing um, this is what the, the enforcement officer sees when they watch the camera this is the car turning into a school street oh, almost getting hit there <laughs> um, and now it's it, because it's past the entrance to the road it's a contravention and they'll be sent to tickets in the post. So permit eligibility. So the, the people, there are a number of people that are exempted. I've said already that the residents, but um, the, the, bus, the school buses, police, businesses, some school staff, um, you know, your, your mail delivery companies, uh, this, um, refuse and bin services so um, these are all exempted which is, is great from a political perspective because it makes it much more um, acceptable to, to residents in the local community but it means there's a big administrative burden um, on the council to, to manage this permit exemptions how do we choose the schools um, this, this selection criteria we invite them to participate and um, they have to be involved in STARS which is the European wide um, sustainable schools scheme where they encourage their, their children to walk and cycle they have to be willing to administer the the the, the, uh, the permit exemption for their staff that have to be existing health and safety issues dangerous parking air pollution traffic congestion um, speed in vehicles there have to be reoccurring reports of confrontations between the local residents and parents. We, you know, um, will regularly get reports of punch-ups between residents uh, and parents on a weekly basis. Uh, there has to be a tolerable impact on traffic movements um, in and around the surrounding areas. So, if by putting in the scheme it doesn't cause chaos and an uh, impact on local public transport, uh, there has to be an alternative um the, you know if the school's at the top of a hill with no bus nearby um, and it's you know it's too tough to cycle there uh, then we probably won't put it in because um, it's not realistic for them to use anything other than the car we'd also only identify schools that um where at least 75 percent of people live within 20 minute walking distance and then we we prioritize schools that are within designated healthy school neighborhoods and these are locations where there's particular um, problems with health, health deprivation and, and air pollution so these are two examples of, of schemes where um, school streets have gone in one was preferred and, and one was not preferred so Norbury Manor um, this is a nice simple scheme on the left hand side it's, uh, it's one road there's simple diversion routes um, for drivers to take 
there's quite a small number of, of residents and houses within the zone, so it's easy to manage the permit exemptions. On the right hand side, this is a much more complicated scheme. There are over 107, 160 addresses um, and residents that need to be managed. There's bus routes nearby, um, there's a lot of signs and um, cameras need to go in and make it expensive. Uh, we weren't very keen on going ahead with this scheme, but because of political pressure, it did go ahead and, and it has proved to be successful. The implementation process, um, we deliver this through what we call um, a traffic management order. It's a local bylaw where um, permit holders are exempted. And, and this really makes, um, creates, it's created it a pedestrian zone. So only pedestrians and cyclists can enter um, unless you've got a permit. Um, we can go either the permanent route or the experimental route. Um, when making these traffic management orders. Experimental is normally the preferred option because this means we don't have to go to um, consultation um, before the scheme goes ahead. We can say that we're delivering the scheme for six to, to 18 months and during that period that will be the consultation period and at the end of that period we'll decide um, based on the, the responses and the consultation whether to make it permanent or remove it. We can deliver about 10 schemes a year um, but only we only can only cope with about three starting each month. Um, and what we've learned really is, is working with schools and um, through the education, uh, it's the behaviour change that is, is key. Um, and if we can get the schools and the parents on board, then the impacts can be dramatic. And this flowchart on the, on the right hand side gives you an idea of what the process uh, for delivering these schemes is. Just talking about compliance and, and the financials, uh, the average scheme costs about uh, £45,000, €48,000, um, and that's mainly because of the camera costs. The cameras are the most expensive um, cost. The operational expenditure is about £40,000 per annum, uh, but this is similar for one scheme as it is the same for one scheme as it is for several schemes because you're paying for somebody in that back office to. Um, monitor the, the parking um, contraventions and to manage the, the permit exemptions. The revenue and the income that can be generated from each scheme varies from about 76,000 per year to 230,000 um, and this income is reinvented to be spent on delivering new, new school streets. The, um, the range in, in income depends on the type of scheme that uh, we're going ahead with. Uh, if you look on the right hand side, you have um, the two images of, of um, school maps. The lower one is a uh, cul de sac or a dead end street, the upper one is a through street. And you know, logically, you're going to get more contraventions and fines for uh, a through street. Uh, and the graph on, on the left hand side shows you the penalty charge notices um, for the through street in yellow and the cul-de-sac, the dead end road uh, in orange. And that's from the first month of the scheme starting uh, through to 18 months afterwards. And there's a dramatic drop off in the first six months and then the level of, of PCNs plateaus and stays stable. Public opinion, um, initially we, we, we got a lot of pushback from the media and tabloids, um, as you can imagine. But actually, there's, there's been a really strong public support and um, most people felt that the, the situation had got so bad and, and children should be walking to school. Uh, and there were concerns about parking displacement onto neighbouring roads outside of the, the zones, but these were, were largely unfounded. So, the outcomes. Um, the outcomes have been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, the, um, there's a massive increase in uh, active travel um, going up um, dramatically between the first before implementation and, and afterwards um, and the car use uh, has gone down dramatically um, and public transport use went down slightly. Head teachers suggested that children who turned up were much more punctual, alert, and happier. 
uh, increase in uptake of school breakfast clubs, and, and this it contributed to both better learning opportunities and health outcomes for the school. So I'm just going to talk about zero emission streets now. Um, this, the first one that I, I was involved with early on was uh, Beach Street. Uh, and this is a covered road, a tunnel underneath the Barbican Estate in the centre of the City of London. Um, and it's an area that had very high pollution levels. Um, and because it was a tunnel, um, but also you had lots of pedestrians walking through in close proximity to the vehicles, so there was really high exposure levels. So the proposal was put forward to, to make it a zero emission street, in which only zero emission vehicles would be allowed through the tunnel. This is introduced um, as an experimental scheme over 18 months and it operates 24 7 every day of the year and the idea is that this will be a pilot um, in advance of a, the delivery of a, a wider zero emission zone uh, it was a big rat run or a through route for for taxis and black cabs which was one of the main reasons why um, pollution was so high because uh, black cabs weren't required to, to switch to electric vehicles for another couple of years. The big issue with this scheme um, has been enforcement and um, the definition of what actually is a zero emission vehicle, um, because there isn't really a, a, a standard definition out there. We came up with a definition that said that it, the vehicle had to be an electric or hybrid vehicle that met, met the following criteria. Uh, the maximum um, engine emissions would be 75 grams of CO2 per kilometer. I had to have a minimum 20 mile zero emission range and be uh, zero, zero 06 equipment uh, nitrogen dioxide emission standards. It was enforced with um, AMPR ca cameras at both ends of the tunnel. Again, 130 pound penalty fine for non compliant vehicles. Uh, and exemptions were given for, for residents living in the estate and, and delivering deliveries to the, the neighbouring buildings. This, um, this scheme only went in in March um, and so it will finish uh, uh, towards the end or summer 2021, um, at which time we'll make a decision whether to go ahead and make it permanent or not. A further scheme is, is Bank Junction. This was um, a traffic management scheme introduced in, in the centre of the city uh, and it restricted access through the junction to buses and cycles only during um, the daytime hours, Monday to Friday, 7am to 7pm. And it was done in response to a high number of cyclists and pedestrian um, deaths at the junction. Uh, you had a lot of pedestrians moving through the area, a lot of cyclists, buses, traffic um, and general traffic. Uh, and it, it just didn't work. So the scheme was extremely controversial. Um, black cabs in particular didn't like it and they um, blockaded the junction several times you know, during 2018 to, um, to try and get the scheme dropped. Fortunately that didn't work um, and uh, it has gone ahead. Um, did you look at the, the map on the um, right hand side. The red area is, is where they said only buses and cycles can enter uh, and you will see that the, the blue is where um, there's local access for deliveries and the vehicles are required to, to turn back and, um, and do a U-turn in, in some locations. Um, again this is enforced through AMPR cameras 130 pound fine for non-compliant vehicles entering the junction. The City of London Corporation, who's the local authority for that area, actually made 12.5 million pounds in fines in one year, um, which I think is a record. And um, but what they've done is they've used this income to uh, make the scheme permanent, and they're also uh, got plans to widen the footways, close off some of the arms and pedestrianise some of the streets uh, and just generally improve the junction overall. So they've got a positive come from it. And 
I think, yes, that is it. It's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, apologies, I hope I didn't go too fast for everybody. Um, please let me know if you've got any questions and, and that's my email address if you want to follow up. Thank you very much, Ben. I think it was perfect. Uh, it was very well structured and, and very clear. Um, I have one question. I don't see anybody yet in the chat <laughs> for you. But I have one question for you. In the meantime, I let the others think and uh, write if they have questions. Um, you mentioned, and it was very, very short, <laughs> about a public opinion. And um, it would be interesting to hear uh, how much time or how did you build up, especially for the school streets, school streets sorry, uh, the public opinion that it would be supportive uh, towards your project because I suppose it wasn't an easy task and probably it's something that interests a lot. Um, I, I think uh, we had a lot of political support um, which, which was very positive um, and I think it was just recognition that the situation had got out of control and um, and you know, the residents in, in the, the support certainly came from the residents um, because they, you know, were dealing with chaos every morning in front of their streets. Um, then we had to get the schools on board. Once the schools were on board, um, we, there was an assumption that the parents probably wouldn't be very happy about it, whatever. Um, and, but we, we sort of plowed ahead and although there was a lot of objections at first, um, the, the parents then came round and actually were very supportive uh, and realised the benefits of, of, of the scheme. So if we ask you about the time frame that you would need to dedicate to that, what would you say? How much time should you invest in yeah, building up uh, public opinion, basically? Uh, so i i think we we probably spent about three months um in preparation with each scheme engaging with with the local community um engaging with the schools um so yeah i think there's a sort of three month leading time upon the consultation and, and stakeholder engagement front mm. okay thank you very much i just wanted to ask this question because often uh, this is something that uh, you know we hear from from your peers as the main question. I have a question in the chat, that's great. Uh, you got a compliment, great presentation. Are ANPR cameras also used to enforce things like keeping private cars out of uh, cycle lanes? John is so, asking. Hi John. Um, so historically we weren't able to use the cameras to enforce that. Um, it was withdrawn so we're not allowed to enforce parking so if somebody parks on double yellow line um we have to ha normally has to be witnessed by a, a traffic warden and we can't use an ampr camera to enforce parking um fines however in response to the covid pandemic and the the rollout of the cycle lanes that is happening across london now uh, because we're being encouraged not to use public transport. The government has allowed local authorities to start enforcing parking on cycle lanes using AMPR cameras. So that is certainly something we are now looking at and um, and, and will be, be, be enforcing uh, through cameras again. John, is there anything else you would like to know? You can unmute. You. No, it's fine. Okay. Is there anybody else who would like to ask a question from Ben? Uh, I don't see anything in the chat so far, but let's give people a little bit of uh, time to think. And I would like to ask uh, each of the speakers um, to think about one recommendation, if you have anything, <laughs> based on your experience that you would like to 
give as a takeaway from today uh, to the participants that you have experience and it's useful to keep in mind for similar type of projects. Uh, so this we will do at the end. Uh, just think about it if you have something like this to share. And I would like to go to Diana or Diana, uh, who is asking, I think it's for Stefan, but uh, maybe if she will correct me, what are the main barriers that small municipalities have to access financing uh, schemes as the one you presented? So I think Stefan, you, you are in a position to answer that. I can make a start and maybe all the others jump in yeah. then since okay. they have more back experience. <laughs> Um, yeah, what, what we've learned is that it's quite an effort for smaller administrations to to apply for funding and financing schemes. That's so the the um, staff side and exp expertise as well. And then what we have also seen that many programs focus on larger scale investments, specifically from European funding institutions that target at 50 million or higher, which is not feasible for smaller communities anyway. Um, yeah, that's probably the, the, the main lessons that we've learned and that we promoted, but probably there's much more from the practitioner side to come up with. And so what would you recommend then for, for small municipalities? What to do? <laughs> <laughs> lo I'm very lo lobby minded, sorry. <laughs> lo lobby EU institutions just to have all smaller and easier accessible funding programs is probably would be also a task for, for city networks just to make these issues visible to, to, to donors and financing institutions that are really interested in financing mobility transitions. I think we're quite busy with that, but it's good to hear that <laughs> you're supporting. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Diana or Diana, uh, is there anything you would like to know in relation to this? Guido, or Guido, sorry. Not sure she's still here, but uh, anyways, if you want to ask anything, you can uh, unmute yourself and we will hear. Okay. Um, then I have Elena uh, Lopez. The question for the local resident, which were the main acceptance factors? Air quality, safety, did you do surveys to check? Elena, is this for Ben or is this for everybody? Well, I think Ben starts and then if the others wish to. Yeah, I'm happy to respond to this one. Um, I would say actually, yeah, air quality is, is, has gone up the, um, the, the sort of scale of importance dramatically in the past couple of years. <laughs> and um, yeah, that was one, one of the driving factors um safety was another issue you know some of the these roads it was just causing gridlock and, and there was a um, you know a lot of confrontation between the residents um but yeah i think you know there's a general um recognition that people want their cities to be more livable um and, you know it's, and actually since the lockdown we found that we're getting people residents writing and saying they loved living in their community when there was no traffic coming through. It was a completely different place. They loved the peace and quiet. Um, and now, you know, traffic has returned to normal. Um, you know, that they're unhappy again. So um, I, I, there does seem to be a big change in, in attitude out there. With regards to surveys, um, we, yes, so we, we surveyed the school and the, and the children to see how they're getting to and from um, uh, the school and, and when that's changed. But also, as we introduce most of these schemes um, under an experimental order, we, the whole period that it's in place, so the six to 12 months, we ask residents to, to write in and, and give us their feedback. And, and we often get a, a surge at the end of that, that sort of 12 month period and we base our decision on the, that feedback and in, in almost all cases there's a, the vast majority of the local residents are supportive um, and, and the scheme is made permanent. 
And Ben, have I understood well before you that you mentioned that also for the school kids, it was an improvement in terms of uh, time they could spend in a school. Was that something that you highlighted? Because I have this memory, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Because that's a huge yes, benefit, yes. Uh, actually, from the parents' point of view, if this is true. Yes, absolutely. Um, we Previously, the parents were leaving it to the last minute because they knew they could drive and be there in, in sort of five minutes. Um, now they were they were planning ahead because they knew that it'd be sort of a 20 minute, half an hour walk. Um, so they were arrived, arriving on time. The children were um, uh, in a better state of mind because they had some exercise and, um, on the way to school. Um, and then often some more children were doing the, the school breakfast clubs where they're, um, they come in earlier and, and have a proper breakfast uh, at the school. And the, the teachers fed back that, you know, there was a, a, cha a noticeable change in attitude and behavior um, of all, all students. So then it is a very interesting outcome actually from the exercise, I would say, which is uh, about well-being of the kids. So um, thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any more questions. So we are just four minutes before ending the webinar. So I would just like to go back to Angela and Jesus. If there is a final word you would like to give a sort of recommendation that you would like to give to the participants of today if they wish to implement a similar project and also to say goodbye, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, I think that what, from our perspective, uh, probably one of our main uh, outcomes from this kind of few projects sometimes is that, uh, well, of course, uh, now we have few projects, but we are stuck uh, we start with uh, easy. I mean, uh, we start with uh, very specific projects that well, they uh, they give gave us the the, the confidence for for a, for our next step. So um, our first recommendation is uh, I, I I feel that uh, Jesus commented before start easy but but start so. Uh, uh, you can obtain your, uh, you can uh, figure out your main assets. So, um, of course, uh, share uh, with other initiatives uh, from your uh, national, uh, other examples from cities uh, on national level, but also a European level. And finally, I would like to also add about the, because I think that it's important about the question uh, regarding the air quality of the main factors for, for this kind of, uh, well, in the case of uh, restriction area, or in our case, in Miami, uh, when we launched the action plan against contamination issues, well, at the beginning, it was a, a, a bit messy because, well, citizens, really didn't understand uh, what, uh, what now I can't uh, use my car in the in the city center so it was uh, some kind of uh, an old for for them but now I think that the the health issues are on the center of, of this kind of uh, of questions about air quality so I think that uh, we now see uh, a better acceptance for, for citizens, uh, more aware of the health issues. And uh, I think this is all from, from, from our side. And to well, thank you for, for, uh, for participating, for let us know to participate in this kind of uh, webinar that is fantastic for, for, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was just one uh, more question from John. Uh, how do you see the uptake of electric vehicles in the next five, ten years? Uh, and what assumptions are being made in your regions to ensure the charging infrastructure is in place? So if you can just briefly respond to that, because he's asking every speaker to, to say what they think. 
Okay, thank you. Yes, good question because we have seen the lags the two years or maybe or maybe more years that the electric vehicles is are now uh, well deployed in the from the manufacturing uh, perspective, but also the infrastructure charging is really, really important in our cities. So, uh, well, I think that now, uh, probably the next years, we are uh, obtaining a good balance between uh, enough charging infrastructure in the city from, from the public uh, perspective, but also from private, for example, we can see now a lot of uh, hotels, uh, gas station, and other private business that they are uh, aware that also uh, uh, put in place a charging point is also uh, well a good business for for, the, for them because it's important for the clients. So I think that we, we can see now a, a better balance between the public infrastructure, the, the infrastructure of, of charging points, but also from the well, from, from the offer of the electric vehicles from manufacturing. I think. Thank you so much. Uh, I give the floor to Stefan now. Okay. Um, First of all, to be brief, the key message, um, as I already mentioned in the presentation, um, if we want to achieve an urban mobility transition towards sustainability, we need to get away from private car use and also shift the funding and invest, um, investments from these private car use related investments towards alternative source uh, ways of mobility. Then um, e-vehicles, um, well, there's a lot going on we see in terms of buses and public transport vehicles. Probably we see a, a big shift there in the coming years. Um, Micromobility, well, it's hard to say, but all the, the, the small kick scooters, um, they should be, you need to find a way just how to deal with them or how to integrate them into mobility systems in a, in a useful and sensitive way other than we have them right now. So we are, for example, following two pilot cities that are trying to implement these kick scooters as a um, dust mite solution for public transport, so how to integrate them into the existing mobility system. And private private e-mobility as said, so I'm not the biggest fan of having replacing combustion engines in a city with electric vehicles that use the same space that have the same potential of, of killing or hurting people. Uh, and plus we have issues with how to deal with charging there which would require private parking in the end and then um, adequate charging solutions so i i hope there will be no so big future for private e mobility or car based mobility in inner cities um well and in the end thank you for inviting me today it was a big pleasure and hope to see you soon Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, uh, Ben. <laughs> Thanks, Perda. Um, just the electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, I, I think there will be a continued uptake in, in electric vehicles. Um, um, you know, it, and it will become normalised. I, I do have concerns about charging infrastructure. We're going ahead with quite a large program of, of 400 charging points this year um in a variety of locations rapid charges sort of on streets and and sort of lamppost charges um but my concern is that actually a lot of the technology is is already out of date and then the vehicles have moved on um and you know we're spending quite a lot of money on infrastructure and technology that you know will be redundant in in a couple of years so i think it's it's You've got to approach it carefully. Um, the takeaway point I, I would sort of give to everybody is, is yeah, if you're putting in a scheme like this that you're worried it's going to be controversial, then then go the experimental route. Say it's a trial. Say you, you're going to put it in for six months a year. Um, that it's going to act as the sort of consultation and stage. And you know. We're going to monitor it, see how it works. If it doesn't work, then we'll we'll take it out. 
because the experience that we found is more often than not people are very fearful of it before it goes in but once it's in and it's working then people are, are very pleased with it and don't want to see it uh, removed uh, yeah thank you very much for, for having me Thank you so much uh, for all the speakers and everybody who was uh, present today. I think it was a very uh, detailed uh, information you, you got, probably a lot of information at, at once, but um, please be reminded that the webinar will be online and you can watch it again and also the materials will, will be sent to you and you can always check uh, the project's website also for for the handbook I have uh, presented uh, to you. And feel free to, to use it also, or to promote it at local level. Um, it's uh, absolutely free to, to use it as a transferability material, for instance, if you would like to, to translate or, or use it in your own countries, then uh, just do it, there is no problem. Be always happy to, to hear about it if you, if you do that. And um, you can see in the chat that Melissa shared also that we have um, an option on the website to subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, we will be having some local events. We shifted because of COVID to more local events in several countries. Uh, so please, uh, if you're interested in future opportunities, then subscribe to the newsletter. And also get in touch uh, with me or Melissa or uh, just uh, visit the website and contact us if you have any questions. Uh, we are really happy to, to help you with your project ideas or um, if you have any learning uh, objectives in the future, the most important that projects are not there just for themselves, they are there to, to basically support you and uh, also the future policy making. I was actually very happy to hear today some ideas, you know, how much work we still have to do actually to make sure that both the funding and the financing will be in the right place in institutions, EU, uh, national, regional and local levels. So a lot of work to do and uh, I'm happy to have uh, this big crowd today. There is the Anybody who would like to say something, please raise your hand or write in a chat. If not, I would just like to close it and uh, wish you a very nice afternoon and stay safe. <laughs>